Okay, so today we complete the, um, the description of the power expansions of uh, meromorphic functions, okay, as we started last time. So remember that we have a meromorphic function, and we considered a singularity A and an analysis. The notation was like this, if I remember what A, R, and capital R, right? So this is the two rays I'm considering. So we have an analysis around this A, and we also uh, considered two circles, <coughs> gamma 1 and gamma 2, this is gamma 1 and this is gamma 2. <coughs> and uh, then we took also this lambda, but this was the notation I used last time. Gamma 1 is a circle centered rotate of radius R1 and R1 is smaller than the radius of gamma 2 another circle center at A, and the radius is R2. So, in, uh, in an uh, explicit way, I can write this, this. And T varies. So, we already observed that the two, the two circles can be one one circle can be, can be scratched, this can be, can be deformed into the other, right? And then we consider the curve gamma, which was gamma 2 plus lambda minus gamma 1 minus lambda, or vice versa, I don't remember the correct, but this was the close curve we were considering, and this close was, of course, homologous to zero because gamma 2 and gamma 1 are homologous, so they are homotopic as functions, okay? And then we, cons well, well, then we established this first relation, which comes from Cauchy integral formula. And uh, this is for 1 over 2 pi i, integral over gamma, and this is the gamma we were considering of f xi, xi minus a, the xi is what? f of, sorry, f of z, sorry, f of z, and z is such that, all right, this is in between, right? So the z is in between, it is contained in the curve, not in contained, it is contained in this small annulus, okay? Then I have to put the index uh, did I use this notation or well I don't remember. This is in any case this is one. Okay? Why? Well because we are taking Z here which represent the, well, a point in this, in this uh, analogs, so that it is in the bounded component of the complement of gamma 2 and in unbounded component of the complement of uh, gamma 1. So the contribution calculated here is zero for this, is to cancel, and only just the this is, to be more correct, this is n gamma z, gamma 2, right? Because gamma 2, okay, only the contribution of gamma 2 is important, okay? And it is 1 because the number of winding times, okay, is 1, right? So this is 1, so we forget about this index, 
uh, I normally forget also this, but well, now I have uh, just to take into consideration this uh, this formula. And if you remember from this, integral formula, sorry, we have obtained that any holomorphic function is in fact complex analytic. Now we are dealing with a meromorphic function in principle and we are dealing with the domain which is not a disk but an annulus. So we'll, we'll see that there is a difference okay, with the case we already seen. All right? If you remember, what we, have, we have considered the center to be A, right? In our expansion, it was the center of the disk at that time. Now, A is the center of the annulus and it is not contained. Okay, we, we added and subtracted A and we wrote, okay, uh, an expression we were, which was then a series and then proved that the, the, the series, uh, the, 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 sorry, the, um, the functions involved in the series were uniformly convergent to something and then we use this fact to, to extract the sum with, uh, from the integral and then express everything in terms of, of power series expansion. Now, if we repeat the same game, okay, now <coughs> first we notice that this is 1 over 2 pi i. So remember that gamma is gamma is gamma 2 plus lambda minus gamma 1 minus lambda. So these two contribution cancel each other, but this is important to remember. So we have integral over gamma 2 f x, x minus z dx c minus 1 over 2 pi i the integral over gamma 1 f of c. Why this minus appears here? Because, well, we have a minus gamma 1, so it means that we are considering the, the curve with the reversed parameterization, so the reverse orientation. And so this uh, has the effect of changing the sign of the integration, right? So this is the minus which comes from this minus here. This minus here is formally means the same curve, but with minus t instead of t. Okay, so the index is negative if you want of the point A. Good. Now we repeat the same game as we did before, that is to say, if we add and subtract A in the denominator in both, in the both integrands, then we have this. Right. But this time if C is in gamma two, we are integrating okay, the distance from A is R two, which is greater than the distance fr from A of Z. When C is in gamma one, then C minus A is R1, which is smaller than the, mod the distance from A of Z. Remember that Z has a modulus, since Z minus A is, okay. Therefore, we will do the following. And the first integral, so the integral over gamma 2, we take out C minus A and observe that this is 1 plus A minus Z over C minus A, right? Like we did before. 
And this number here is such that the modulus is smaller than 1. Correct? Because we are integrating over gamma 2 and on gamma 2, on the other side, oh sorry, I forgot, this is a minus, right, plus the integral over gamma 1, but the, the minus is in front, right, so minus. Then I repeat the same stuff, but instead of collecting uh, C minus A, I collect uh, A minus Z, right? So that I have 1 plus C minus A over A minus Z. Of course, dx C and dx C. Because on gamma 1, I have that C minus A is R1, which is smaller than Z minus A. And that that's give you that this is smaller than one. Correct? Now so the first part can be regarded as something we already we have already done, right? Because then we express this as a summation of this number here, right? So, I have that the first part is in fact the integral over gamma 2 of what? Of f of c, then I have c minus a to the power n, minus n plus 1 summation and greater or equal to 0 and here I have z minus a, right? the power n, which leads to what we, uh, to what we already know, right? Then I have a minus here, and in fact, uh, sorry if I stop here, but uh, in fact if I had a point inside of this, I wouldn't consider this gamma 1, right? I could just consider gamma 2. A circle center A, radius greater than the modulus of Z minus A. Hmm? Then I have this minus here and here I have the summation n greater or equal to 0, f of C. And then I have here Z minus A, right, n plus 1 and here C minus A but with a minus in front. You see, because, let me show you this, I have C minus A plus A minus Z, then I have, as I said, A minus Z times 1 plus C minus A, 1 plus, sorry, over A minus Z. And this is minus Z minus A or if you want minus here and z minus a here, right? So I need this, okay? So that I have this minus here which cancel this and dx here, right? So surprisingly then I obtain, oh sorry, and n is of course here, right? So I obtain the following, that when you have a singularity, and then we'll see how to describe which kind of singularity uh, according to, the, to what we obtain, we have not just a simple power exp series expansion like this, but a generalized power series expansion with coefficients also negative. Sorry, not coefficient, but exponents, negative, right? So this number here represents what? This stuff, right? 
because when n is 0, this is z minus a to the power minus 1, right? And going on, we have all possible negative exponents as well, the positive exponent coming from here. OK? Good. So this generalized power expansion is known in complex analysis as Laurent series. And of course, it applies not only to holomorphic functions, in which case we have only n non-negative hmm, exponents, but also to meromorphic functions. Now we'll get a bit more into the details of the description. So what are the Cn for the different cases, right? So in general, we have that Cn, so the coefficients with this notation. So Cn can be obtained as 1 over 2 pi i, the integral of a gamma, of fxc, x minus a, and plus 1 dx a. This is the way to calculate the coefficients. And in particular, we observe that z equal to a is a removable singularity if c uh, n are 0 for n negative. That is to say, if the function is, in fact, holomorphic at A, correct? So the Laurent series with coefficient, with coefficient exponent, so with parameters, with indexes, going from minus infinity to, to plus infinity, in, instead of going from minus infinity, starts from 0 to infinity. So the normal power series expansion. So it is, norm, it is analytic, it's complex analytic. Z equal to A is a pole. And remember that the pole is a certain order, finite order, f and only f, okay, cn is equal to 0 for any n smaller than minus m, okay, m order of the pole. Pardon me? Well, m. I write m. m is in c, right? The order is m. Is OK, minus m. If you write m, yes, you're right. Minus m. It's positive. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yes. It's m and is in z, and m negative means that minus m is the order. Correct. What I mean is that in this case, you have a summation of just a finite number of summons with negative exponents in this expansion, in the Laurent expansion, as it is expected. And finally, the singularity is essential if none of the previous cases applies. In a sense, uh, then, if it is not possible to file a minimal negative index or, posit uh, or, or zero or non-positive, say, for any such that all the coefficients are zero in the power in the Laurent series, right? So, all right. Um, so, as I probably already said, the interesting coefficient in the Laurent series is this one. And this is called the residue, okay? If f, f uh, is meromorphic,
Uh, well, sometimes, well, this is probably something I already have already done. Sometimes there is a, an abuse in, in the information and in, in, in terminologies. Sometimes you use meromorphism to say not holomorphic, but singularities are restricted to poles. And that's what I also said probably last time. In this case, I'm saying, well, A is a singularity and well, not necessarily A is a pole. So probably in the first slides I used, I just say F meromorphic is A, not holomorphic at A, to be more precise. Okay? But sometimes, some books you can find meromorphic with singularities, and then they precise meromorphic with poles, meromorphic with them. Okay? So just think. So if F is meromorphic, so when there are poles in particular, well, C minus 1 uh, uh, is very interesting, and it's called residue of f and 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 i already i think that i already told you why this c minus 1 the residue is important but residues of f uh, for the pole a okay and this is somehow too long so i write it this okay residue function is f and the singular the pole is a This coefficient is important because, as I showed you, if f is meromorphic, so if f has the power essential with the principal part, which is the part of the Laurent series with negative coefficients, the finite part, then it has also the, 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 the power series expansion with positive exponents, then it has this expression in a neighborhood of A is like this. plus summation, remember that I use this notation, right? Okay. And I notice that if I consider a curve, gamma, closed curve, the integral of uh, this closed curve, gamma, uh, uh, say around zero, around A, sorry, this is what is C minus 1, right? So in order to cut, well, this is the only contribution to the integral. If you know C minus 1, well, and you know the index, in case you have a very simple curve, like we normally use a, a, a circle around the point A, so to know C minus 1 is equivalent to know this in this integral. That's why it is important. So now the problem is maybe how we calculate this. So since we have this expression here, remember that we also have this. Fz times z minus a to the power m. m is the order of the pole as a holomorphic function g of z, right? Right. So from this, you obtain that this is a remark, right? So maybe put it here that the residue of f at a, remember that m is the order, is, well, c minus 1, is 1 over m minus 1 factorial times g, the mth derivative, m minus 1, sorry, derivative of a, of m of g at a. That's the way to calculate if you want. If you find this, you calculate the residue in this way. And this is number six, I guess. So let us now consider some applications of this uh, calculus of the residues of a meromorphic function. In particular, let me consider this function here. This is an exercise, if you want, and then we'll see a bit more in detail the general situation. So consider this function here. 
okay well this function is of course not holomorphic in the entire plane right well this is the ratio of two polynomials and the complex setting any polynomial of degree n and greater than one uh, greater than zero has n roots so this polynomial here the denominator vanishes at four points right so the f is holomorphic and c minus z1 z2 d3 and d4 where zj is one of the roots of 1 plus z to the power 4. So, this polynomial. Okay. So, if we want to solve this, well, I, I might say that this, this is just an exercise, but in case, well, this is the problem you have to solve. And I think that in one of the first lessons, we already solved similar examples. And, uh, and we are looking for an application of the Moivre formula. And these four roots, which are all distinct, are in fact on the unit circle. And they are, OK, equally, they are like this, right? This, 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 this. So they have this aspect A plus A, A, and A is plus or minus in all possibilities. Okay? So these are the four. So th the singularities are, of course, isolated as expected. Can they be uh, essential singularities? So these are singularities. These are not removable singularities. Because, well, if you take z minus one of these roots, OK, and take the limit as z to one of these roots of f of z, z minus this root, Okay, you obtain something which is not bounded. So you cannot, you cannot consider this as a, a as an, a removable singular. Any of these roots to be as a removable singularity. So it is not the case of a removable singularity. Can it be the an essential singularity? Why not? The answer is not, of course. Sure. This is the correct answer. So, thank you. So, for any of these roots, you can always find a positive integer associated to this, such that z minus this root to this power times the function is, in fact, holomorphic. So, we are dealing with poles. Okay? And these poles are, okay, finite number, isolated as expected, and not real. Because no real number can have this property to be is uh, fourth power to be minus one, okay? And it is obvious why. Now, uh, all right. So I write this. Uh, 1 plus z squared in this way. So, okay, this is 1 plus z, no, z squared, but z to the power 4, sorry. Hmm? Because I apply the fundamental theorem of algebra four times, okay? And I, I know that I have four distinct roots. So all these roots are simple roots, right? Okay? And here I have harmonic polynomials so that I have a z minus z 
j okay as as a factor correct good so i consider z1 to be well this is the 1 this is the 2 this is the z3 and this is the 4 according to the standard orientation okay the first <coughs> positive real and the imaginary part so it should be like this z2 is minus and then okay z3 is minus minus i and d4 is now the, now the, the, the next step is calculate the residues associated to this poles there are four poles pole residues okay so we want to calculate the residues of f and the j how can we do this suggestions No, okay. So theoretically, in principle, you are correct. I agree with you. But this is a long, uh, this is a long <laughs> procedure. I'm not going to. Okay. All right. All right. So I prefer this. Okay. Okay. All right. So we are dealing with a simple pole. And so that the function f of z is in fact z squared over z minus z1, z minus z2, z minus z3, and z minus z4. Okay, to calculate the residue of f for the pole z1, I simply calculate what? The limit as z tends to z1 of what? z minus z1 f of z, right? So I have here z1 squared, because this is continuous, z minus z1 cancel, and I have z1 minus z2, z1 minus z3, and z1 minus z4, okay? And these are numbers, which I can cal calculate. So in general, the residue of f of the poles zj for f is zj to the power 2 over product, okay, zj minus zk, k different from j, k, 1, 2, 3, 4, all right? This is a general expression. Good. So as I said, just make this calculation in this particular case. So remember that z1 is uh, this, okay? So z1 squared is, okay, I have this squared minus z squared, the same amount. So I have only the double product. So I have 2 square root over 2i. I'm sorry, times, right? Correct? Yeah, okay. And then I invite you to to show that we have the following that z1 minus z2 
z1 minus z3 z1 minus z4 which is the denominator in the calculus of the, the calculation of the residue we are dealing is in fact something which can be okay we, we do it okay so z2 remember z2 is minus plus so I have z1 okay from the difference okay and then I have nothing else then remember that the z3 is minus z2 over 2 minus i and z1 is as I said before so I have okay minus so doubles the real part and doubles the imaginary part and finally z4 is okay I have z so that when summing together I have i right correct so this is 2i and this therefore the residue we are calculating is i over 2i okay right which can be also written as 1 minus i over 4 square root of 2 okay after multiplying times the conjugate of 1 plus i okay so i invite you to verify that the residue of f of z2 for this f is just minus 1 minus i over 4 square root of 2 this is an exercise okay an exercise for you but it's not difficult to, to, to understand why okay repeat the calculation just stupid calculation okay. and now okay this is number nine sorry let us go to an application of what we have found because this is just trivia calculation I would say trivia calculation now let us consider this situation we have the four poles on the unit circle this is the z1 this is the two this is the three and this is the four right let us take the half circle this is the origin right of radius rho and rho is greater than 1 and we consider as a curve gamma the half circle from here and this segment so the segment so rho is half circle of radius Rho uh, and segment real segment minus rho rho. Okay, this is minus rho and this is rho. With this orientation, this is a contour of uh, what half disc so diameter and half circle and I want to calculate the integral of a gamma of the function z squared over 1 plus z to the power 4 dz this from our consideration is simply well I put 1 over 2 pi i in front because I normally forget it okay this is simply what 
the sum of the residues. But which residues? The residues of the poles which are contained in this curve gamma. So the residue of Z1 and the residue of Z2. So it is the residue, the sum of these two residues. Okay? And we already know what it is. It is uh, 1 minus i over 4 plus 1 minus 1 minus i over 4 square root of 2, which means that this number here is, uh, sorry, it's minus 2i over 4 square root of 2. It uh, should be, right? Good. That is to say that this integral dz is okay, 4 pi minus 1 cancel this minus in front over 4 root of 2 is pi over square root of 2. What is this useful for? Well, it can be applied for real integration of, of uh, rational functions and over the entire real axis. In fact, the integral of a gamma of z squared over 1 plus z is the integral of the, the circle of half circle, okay, the radius rho plus the integral between minus rho and rho so I use the additive property of the line integral all right so when I restrict my consideration on the real segment in fact instead of considering z I consider the real numbers in these segments so this reduces to what to the integral which is normally very odd to calculate right especially when you want to be sure that this number exists or something like this and rho can be very large and become actually infinite and we show that when rho becomes infinite this is zero so that from the residue we know the, the value of this indefinite integral, real integral, we conclude this. Once we prove that making rho okay big enough, this number here is smaller than epsilon, all right? So it's all, it suffices to show this, to conclude, because we have the following. Okay, so let us consider the integral over C rho of d squared 1 plus z to the power 4 dz. Okay, remember that over CR, we have that Z is rho EI theta. We are moving, okay, and theta varies between 0 and pi, right? So DZ is I rho EI theta D theta. Good. So, after substituting, I have that the integral there is equivalent to the integral of what? Of rho squared e i theta squared hmm, times i rho e i 
theta d theta over 1 plus rho the power 4 e i theta and that is it. Correct? So, I am probably better write it this way. I collect everything say all right, I put i in front, then I have e i 3 theta 1 plus ok. Now, let us consider for a while this picture here. This is the origin and this is the circle of radius rho. <coughs> 1 plus rho to the power 4 e i 4 theta moves, ok. Remember that rho is greater than 1. moves on, so sorry, this is the modulus of, uh, of uh, points lying, lying on this circle here. The center is 1 and the radius is rho to the power 4, correct? You see this? This is a circle centered at 1 of radius rho to the power 4. When theta varies, you probably see this better if you consider well. Theta varies rho is fixed. So, if you consider this number here as say w rho and the so, rho is fixed it depends only on theta right rho is given. So, w theta minus 1 is modulus constant equal to right. So, it is a circle it well it is not a circle well points with this property lies on a circle. Geometrically, it means that we are in this situation. So, this, this is the description of the point of the set and see where these points can stay, ok, varying theta. Hmm? And the rho is greater than 1. So, this is 0, right? Because if rho is greater than 1, rho to the power 4 is of course greater than 1, ok. So, I have that from this picture, I obtained 1 plus rho to the power 4 e i 4 theta is greater than 1 minus, sorry, rho to the power 4 minus 1, which is this distance here, rho to the power 4 minus 1. So, this is the distance, this small part of the segment and this can be seen easily geometrically ok. So, each point here has a distance from the origin which is of course, larger than this, this is the minimum right. So, with this inequality we actually conclude. We conclude because we have that, well remember that we have the integral, we have to estimate this integral. Right? This was the integral over, uh, over sorry, CR, C raw of 
f z dz. Or if you want the integral over c rho of z squared over 1 plus Okay. So, one extra row up appears. So, here the exponents are 2 and 4. 4 and 3 here is because when calculating the dz, a row comes into, okay, into our calculations. But then if I take this integral, actually the, the modulus of this integral, This is smaller or equal to what? To the integral 0 pi of to the power 3 of uh, 1, sorry, rho to the power 4 minus 1, okay, d theta. Because I have that 1 plus rho to the power 4 e i 4 theta. because of this inequality. So this number here is pi or cube over rho 4 minus 1 which tends to 0 and rho tends to plus infinity because the denominator, the, the degree of the denominator, this is a rational function in rho, the degree of the denominator is larger, okay, so that this number can be made as small as I want and so that I conclude that the integral of this rational function over the entire real axis is this as an application of the residue theorem. The residue theorem is the result we applied. So in a sense, it calculates the value of an integral along a curve as the sum of the, the uh, residues times 2 pi i of the residues of the poles uh, in, the, in the bounded, in the bounded uh, component uh, of the complement of the curve gamma. Okay, so this is not by accident what, uh, so it's just an example of course, but this is not one example, this can be generalized, okay. So let me just sketch the ideas for the general situation. So assume that we have a rational function and you want to calculate the integral of a rational function. That is to say, uh, and PQ polynomials. And we have to, well, to, to calculate this, but this has to have to exist first, okay? <laughs> so we have to be sure that this is something meaningful. So first of all, we have to assume the no singularities can be found on the real axis. So, first of all, q of x is different from 0 for any x, okay? Or, to be more precise, or R has no poles on R, which is more correct. So, q can be a zero, Q can have a zero, but the P has to have the same zero, okay? Furthermore, this is not enough because if I consider the integral also in a smaller domain of something like this, this is not converging, okay? Right? So I'm assuming, assume that the degree of the denominator 
is greater or equal to the degree of the numerator plus 2, which guarantees that convergence uh, uh, exists. Okay? Because then we can compare this ratio to 1 over x squared at least, and 1 over x squared is converging, okay? which is interesting and important to know. <laughs> So, in fact, in the previous example, let us go back to the example we started from, we have a polynomial with no poles on the axis. So we have, a, sorry, a rational function. So two polynomials, one of the numerator, one of the denominator. The degree of the denominator is exactly two plus the degree of the numerator, which is good, and no poles of f, can be found on the real axis. So the general situation is like this. With this assumption, we can show that this number can be calculated using the um, residues. And it goes like, like this. So we need some extra. So we repeat the same argument as we did before. We take this to be the curve, so minus rho and rho, okay? So actually, it suffices to consider the residues of the poles which lie in the upper half plane. So the imaginary part of Zj has to be positive, and this suffices, okay, for our consideration. Or if you prefer, you can repeat analogous consideration for the, so but at, uh, so it, it, it's better to 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 reduce our calculation to what we are interested in okay in the previous case you could repeat everything with the other two poles and you have circle there. it was exactly sim this symmetric problem mm -hmm. okay now r of z can be written as now, and according to our assumption, a naught plus a one z plus plus a n z n, and q of z is like this, where m is n at least m plus two. In other words, if I collect here the leading term. Yes, so I have a naught, well, a n plus a n minus 1 over z plus plus a naught over z to the power n. Here I have z to the power m, and then I have b m plus b m minus 1 over z plus b naught over z to the m, which is also 1 over z m minus n, and then this is like before. Which tells us that the important um, part to be considered in the integral is this, right? The others are somehow, can be neglected. Huh? And the fact that m is at least uh, n plus 2 means that m minus n is at least 2, which is good because we can compare then, okay, the, the integral with 1 over z to the square, to z squared, 1 over z squared, right? But, and our explicit example, we also showed that the contribution of the integral along this half circle was infinitesimal when rho tend to infinity. When rho tends to infinity, well, is it normally the case? Well, it is because, with our assumptions, huh? it is because, well, since we have that uh, well, actually, I probably have to use the same. We have that R of Z, sorry, 
as 1 over z m minus n and remember that m minus n is greater or equal to 2 and then I have here something which is a n which means that when I consider z times r of z because of this assumption and because of this expression this can be made smaller than epsilon if z is greater than a rho star. So, if z is taken far away from the 0 this number this product can be made smaller than epsilon and this is what we need. In fact, the integral of a C rho of r of z dz is well rho c rho is uh, what well, the set of points of rho e i theta right and theta varies and this segment. So, I substitute and I obtain that this is the integral over and then I again I rho times okay probably E i theta right in here. That is to say that when I consider the integral the modulus of this integral this is small or equal to integral of rho and this can be made smaller than epsilon because of this. So, we can control this and this explains why the in the previous consideration we obtained the final result as an application of the residue theorem. Well, this is one step. Then let me also say that the application of the residue theorem uh, works fine also in other odd situation for real integration. It is to say the following 17. So, assume that we have to calculate this integral. It is another exercise, ok. 1 over a plus b cos theta d theta ok. This is for a b real and assume that a is greater than b. And I think it well we probably have to consider a b positive. So, this is not a situation because it is not a rational function. It is uh, trigonometric polynomial the ok. So, it is a rational trigonometric polynomial which is normally odd. So, how can we transform this integral in order to apply the residue theorem? So, here apparently we are dealing with something which is real everything is real right here, but uh, remember that passing from real to the complex the cosine of theta is 1 over 2 e i theta plus e minus theta. Theta is 1 over 2 i of this right. Now, consider z to lie on the unit disc not on the unit disc unit circle sorry in the complex plane. So, z is e i theta and theta varies sorry 2 pi correct modulus 1 e i theta good. So, that cos theta is 1 half z plus 1 over z or z minus 1 z to the power minus 1 right. 
Similarly, sin theta is one half, one over two i, sorry, z minus one over z. But now I have also that from z equal to e i theta and, th and theta varies, i is fixed, right? This z, this z is i e i z theta d theta or if you want the z is i z d theta, right? In other words, I can substitute d theta with d z over 1 i z. That is to say the, in the, the expression, the integrand can be the can be substituted by this. So the integral is the th the theta is okay uh, dz over i z, and then I have one over a plus b z uh, plus one over z, and then half. So I substituted cos theta and d theta uh, when considering z to be e i theta. So that this becomes the integral over this unit circle of what? 1 over 2a plus b z plus b over z times i z dz and then I have to put a 2 in front, right, which comes from this denominator. All right. So, I have, I have 2 over, I put this way, 2ib, okay, so this c and z cancel here, b is here, and I have uh, 1 over 2az plus z squared plus z, 2 over b, 2a over bz plus z squared plus z and then I have bz finally. So that after this change of variables I have again a rational function. The degree of the denominator is greater or equal to 2 plus the degree of the numerator. In this case the degree of the denominator is 2 and the, and the numerator is constant. So that we can apply, okay, something which is, well, in this case we are actually integrating over a circle, not over the entire real axis. The last time is? Sure, thank you. This is 1. B, yes, is here, Z and Z cancel, correct. Yes. So, let me just conclude if I can. Mm -hmm. So I have that this number here is continue 1 over i b integral over 1. I have c squared plus 2a over b z plus 1 d z. This is a polynomial uh, in c. Uh, and it has two roots, right? Okay. So now, up to now, we haven't uh, used the assumptions about A and B. They are real, but w what about the um, the discriminant? 
we have this is a square over b squared minus 4, right? Uh, minus 1, sorry, right? And uh, this is, well, if a, as I am assumed, is greater than b, this number here is this is positive, right? So, we have two real roots. And we can also say that if alpha and beta are the two roots, the modulus of the two roots is 1. You see this? The constant term, right. In other words, if modulus of alpha is greater than 1, modulus of beta is to be smaller than 1. And they cannot have be, it cannot have both modules equal to 1, which means the 1 is inside the unit circle and uh, unit disk and the other is outside. So, that we have to consider just the residue for this calculation of the root which lies in the unit disk because we are integrating over the unit circle. In other words, the, 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 the this integral is the integral 2 1 b and this is 2 i b times 2 pi i, the residue of this function here, alpha, well, well of beta, okay, beta, because beta is modulus more than 1. Well, these two roots, as I said, are simple roots, so that we have this, right? Or plus 2a over bz plus 1 is in fact z minus alpha times z minus beta. So that the residue of f, f beta, where f of z remember is 1 over z squared plus 2a over bz plus 1, okay is the limit as z tends to beta of what? 1 over z minus alpha and then I have to put something in front I guess, right? No, well, it is 1 over beta minus alpha. But then remember that alpha was some uh, well, well can be calculated is minus two a over b plus what uh, a squared over b squared minus one and over two and beta is minus two a over b minus square over b squared minus one right so that the power the residue is. Uh, should be something like, well, these two parts cancel, right? No, these two parts cancel and I have uh, what is left here is okay. So, we are finished. This is number 20. So, put it together, we have the integral we were started from
we are we are starting from that is this is is okay let me prob 2 pi i i over 2 b times uh, what 1 what is here the residue was calculated somewhere else so I said this a squared over b squared minus 1 if I'm not mistaken okay uh, yes I hope so the residue times 2 pi i so this is well 2 and 2 cancel minus b over maybe there is a mistake somewhere because uh, in my calculation it should be different but anyway <laughs> please follow the the calculation repeat the calculation and check where the mistake well some somewhere I, I probably wrote something wrong here because there is a b bit okay just check okay the idea is that if you know the residue theorem you can solve this problem but you have to be probably more careful about the calculation of the real roots alpha and beta last but not least let me just point out something which maybe has to be remind it okay check it we come back to this um, yes we have dealt only with simple poles so far and with simple poles it is so in, in, in a sense it is sim simple also to calculate residue so let me just go to more generic situation assume that we have this which is of course a function which is a meromorphic function but not rational function so the poles are a and b so the residue of f a is simply e a a minus b and similarly okay b minus a right now the question is what if I consider g of z to be e to the power z over z minus a squared in this case the pole a is not simple So what is the residue of G at A? How we calculate this? Well, we cannot apply this simple factor. We, we can do like this. We can do something like this. Okay. Well, first, substitute to z with uh, z minus a plus a so that we have z minus a as a up to a constant we have e z minus a as in the denominator as a numerator the same factor which appears in the denominator so we, then we expand we have e a times 1 plus z minus a plus minus a squared n over n factorial plus something and here z minus a squared which means that 
f of z uh, sorry g of z is in fact E a times 1 over z minus a squared plus 1 over z minus a plus 1 over 2 factorial plus something else which is 1 over 3 factorial z minus a plus blah blah blah. And hence the residue at a is e a. So, the general procedure requires to write the Lorentz series, but in practical use you have to simply find a way, a simple way, very simple way to, to determine this coefficients. Okay? Good. Or if you are in big troubles, and well in this case it's quite easy to see also that the, the, the order is 2, right? But if you are in big troubles, the only solution is to calculate derivatives and so on and so forth. Huh? All right. So let me now uh, almost conclude what I have to say about uh, the application of the residue. But I just, I just want to point out that in some books there is also this interesting case. And it is like this. So you have rational function over the real integrated over the positive reals times something which is like this. And R R has no poles and no no real poles. And we also assume so we substitute x with z and we consider r to be the extension over the complex of a rational real function. Okay real rational function and we have these assumptions here. So, so the novelty in this situation is that we cannot apply like for example we have to calculate something like this x to the minus c1 plus x okay. and c say well, this is standard example. But here apparently there is one pole for sure x equal to minus 1 and so oh, positive real ok is what I am assuming. So it has a, 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 a real pole but there is also the 0 appearing as a singularity. But 0 is the branch point, so it's not a point where the function can be extended. So what I'm saying is that remember that we are considering here so yes, right? So it cannot be that this function here is in fact defined at zero. So, just just a sketch idea of how things go on. But we consider zero is in fact like for the. For the square root and so on, is a point where you, you cannot define a holomorphic function when you have powers, okay? With no, no integer, non positive integers powers. And we have this pole at minus 1 for the case we are considering. We normally take two disks, two, yes, and that's the curve gamma, this. Well, this distance is delta. 
this, this is the origin. So, sorry, maybe the origin is here, right? <laughs> so this is R, this is raw. And this is in the complement of the plane with the infinite slit from zero to infinity. Here we can define also the logarithm, which is because it is a simply connected domain. Uh, uh, whose uh, complement contains zero. Hmm? Now, <coughs> it is that gamma can be modified the form to a point. This gamma is homologous to zero. And if we apply the um, residue theorem passing through the complex notation, we just, sorry, just take, and minus one is here, right? We just take the residue. In our example, we had, okay, we just take this, show that what you are considering on the contour depends only on this part here, but not, so the contribution on the, portion of circles as irrelevant for the integral, and then we can conclude something. I just wanted to mention this because this is maybe interesting to at least know that it can be possible to, because it is an example where you, can, you, you do not take the same contour, okay? Circle, half circle, and okay. So what is, left to show is, well, ex well, the, what I said is correct, okay? So I will just come back to this, see again the calculation in the previous uh, exercise and come back to this, but I promise that this is the last time I'm talking about residue theorem and application because otherwise it becomes just a course, an entire course in how to apply the residue theorem according to several different situations, okay? So each time you have to know which contour, which function, what are the manipulation you have to deal with. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to give you all the, say, details in this very complicated stuff. However, it is important to know that in some cases, this is the only way to calculate some integrals. Huh? And it, is, it has also many applications in, uh, in engineering calculations. So for instance, people from uh, other faculties like engineering do not know anything about holomorphic function, but they do know how to apply <laughs> residue theorem, <laughs> okay? But in case there are books, there are, <laughs> there are, okay. So these are somehow just basic examples uh, in particular, the first one was a reasonable example. The second one was somehow an application of a previous result. And this is a more complicated example, which we'll just uh, mention and quite quickly show you how, uh, how to be uh, faced. Okay? Thank you for your attention. I'll stop here.